should actually say good afternoon, uh, New Covenant Church of the Apostles, this May the 26th, 2024. Uh, the title of the message is Jesus Powerful Humility. And we're going to find a, a very interesting side of, of our Lord and Savior. You know, and we're going to find as we go through the story of Jesus, he was not your typical leader. He's a king, but not your typical king. And his pathway to power, or his ideas as to what that looked like, we're going to find are much different from the way we might think would be the pathway to power, the way we, we might think power is exercised. You know, I'm going to open up here a verse in Matthew, Matthew 3. Uh, this is one of several passages where John the Baptist is paving the way for the Messiah. And, of course, in all of these, he very openly admits, I am not the Messiah. Because people ask him, are you the Messiah? And he says, no, I am not. But I am here to pave the way for him. And then he introduces the Messiah and he says, this is what the Messiah is going to do. And of course, keep in mind, this is a, in a Jewish background. And the Jewish expectation of the Messiah was a conquering king. And Jesus did come to be a conquering king. And not merely a spiritual kingdom, though there is a spiritual component, but that Jesus is coming back. He's going to literally rule from his throne in Jerusalem. And that he will bear rule over this planet much the same way that Biden sits on the seat of the President of the United States or any other head of state uh, that you can mention. Netanyahu is the Prime Minister of Israel, for example, in the literal sense. When Jesus, there's a time that Jesus is coming back, he's going to rule in that sense. And, and, and starting in verse 11 here, uh, John the Baptist paints a picture of a coming king. Starting in verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water in unto repentance. You see, folks, he was preparing them. And how do we prepare for the Lord? We repent. We pray. We seek God. But then he adds, he who is coming after me is mightier than I. So much mightier that John says, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, we, I think most of us in here, a lot of us in the online audience have an idea what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. But not a lot of people realize what the baptism of fire is. Now, some of you who may be in the military have a, a concept from the military. They would often use the term baptism of fire to refer to that very first firefight when going to war. That would be the baptism of fire from the perspective of a military person. And what God has in mind is somewhat similar. He's not training us to take AK-47s. And M16s into the battlefield, that's not what we train to do. That's not how we conquer. But the baptism of fire, talking about here, is the persecution that would arise because we name the name of Christ. We receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. We're filled with the power of God, the resurrection power of God. But then there's a baptism of fire that immerses us into the cross of Christ. So we see this interesting juxtaposition of statements of power but then there are other statements that imply that we the road may be humbler than what we think from our worldly perspectives when we start talking about things relating to the kingdom it gets harsher here verse 12 his whittling fan is in his hand he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So John the Baptist is presenting the picture of this Messiah as his conquering king. He baptizes with the Holy Spirit. He baptizes with fire. But then there's a gathering of the wheat, which is those who believe in him into the barn. 
And then fire comes up again, but it's that's judgment, destruction to his enemies. So he paints this picture of this conquering king here. So that when he walks into the room, you get on your hands and knees and you do obeisance and you bow before him and say, Oh, mighty king. But did that happen that way? Did it, it, it flowed a different way. You go in the text here, Jesus comes to John to be baptized. Now keep in mind, John is proclaiming baptism as a baptism of repentance. And so you have all these people in Israel, they're repenting of their sins, they're weeping over their sins. And you're pointing away to the coming king, and then suddenly the king is coming, and you say, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. We're building up to the climax here. But the climax wasn't what John the Baptist expected. He was going to make this royal introduction to the king when he sees Jesus coming towards him as he's baptizing people in the River Jordan. Jesus asks him to be baptized. And so he, he then says, John the Baptist says, Lord, I need you to baptize me and you come to me. Our Lord and Savior was taking a humble path. He was taking the path of powerful humility. Picking up in verse 15, we read, But Jesus answered and said to him, He's responding to John the Baptist's anxiety, his perplexed state of mind. He, he's giving him the answer here. He says, permit it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, Jesus wasn't coming because he personally needed to repent. And we're going to find out later, it was for our sakes that he was baptized. And then, of course, John the Baptist allowed in verse 16. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Folks, I want to just drop something here. If you hear people say the Trinity is not in the Bible, they don't know their Bible. We see right here all three persons of the Trinity. We see Jesus Christ as the Son of God. We see the voice of the Father and the Holy Spirit descending like a dove on, on our Lord and Savior. And, of course, this marks a turning in Jesus' life. Jesus was born 100% God, 100% man. The human nature was open to God. The human nature was sinless, was flawless. But what was happening here, that the, the human side was being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that was for our sakes, folks. And this marked a turning point in his ministry because he went from being the perfect son of God. He went from a, a lifetime of receiving revelation of God, of learning not only from the Father, but from whoever would teach. And from this point forward, he was going to minister with power. It was after this point that we would see the records of the miracles, of the resurrections, we would, we would see powerful testimonies of the worst sinners turning around and be living holy lives before God. We would see, after this, the great crowds following him. And he would also have his baptism of fire, watching those same crowds evaporate when the persecution came. But right here, he is filled with the Holy Spirit filled with all the fullness of the Godhead. 
And of course, he has that and the divine nature. But this unfilling that's happening here is in reference to the human nature of Jesus. That he would, from this point on, minister on the human side under the anointing of the Lord. And Paul talks about this, the fullness of the Godhead. And he speaks of Christ here. And in Colossians 2, starting in verse 8, he warns the Colossians not to let people cheat them through philosophy that would be based after the ways of man and not according to Christ. And oh, it's so easy, folks. There's lots of philosophies out there, lots of theologies out there, lots of pastors out there that will tell you things that sound nice. Uh, and on the surface, it may even seem biblical because they can take a verse out of context and tap a verse on and say, this is what God's doing. I recently went to a prayer meeting slash movie night. And it was a pretty good time. The movie was a powerful movie, ending with someone being a drag addict being radically turned around. But it, as a premiere, it had the usual trappings. You could go and rub elbows with the actors, take your picture. It was a premiere. It was a promotional event. And that seems good. That's all good, but it's so easy, folks. It's so easy, folks. There's theologies that will tell us that it's our place to seize the realms of power to take dominion. That Jesus seized the power when he was on this earth. In fact, he, he had someone once tell him, all these kingdoms are mine. Satan tempted him with the, the, the lure of power. All the world is mine. If you worship me, I will give it all to you. Sounds tempting. All you got to do is worship the devil. And folks, we have leaders around the world who worship the devil. We've been doing a series on Mystery Babylon. At the heart of it is this false religiousism. We have Luciferians at the highest levels of power in the United States of America. The, the similar scene in Britain, Europe, all of these nations. There are, are filled with people that when Satan came to them and said, I will give you this if you worship me, they bowed down and they worshiped him. What did Jesus do when he was given the, uh, the opportunity to simply seize power? He said the following, Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus rejected power. I want to repeat that. He rejected worldly power. And it's not because he was envisioning this eternal spiritual kingdom. Yes, there is that. The, the kingdom of God is here now, spiritually. When we're under the anointing, we, we can seek God. He gives us the anointing. We can lay our hands. We, we've seen this happen. We've seen miraculous answers to prayer. In the last several years, two major miracles have happened. One involving saving someone from death, the other involving the creation of new life. The result of one is I still have my wife, sister, Ann with me. And the other one, we have acquired a grandson. And those aren't the only miracles. Around the world, God is doing wonderful, marvelous works. So I don't want to take away from the spiritual kingdom. Uh, but Jesus wasn't rejecting worldly power to have a kingdom that was only spiritual. Jesus was trusting in God. 
he saw forward to the day when the kingdom would be delivered to him. He'll sit on his throne in Jerusalem and he will rule a literal worldwide kingdom with just as much finality. In fact, I would say far, far more certainty than our current president is in assuming the powers of his presidency. And when Jesus returns, it will be, there'll be a thousand year reign followed by eternity. But Jesus wasn't going to seize it through human machination. He was going to follow the Father's plan. And he was willing to humble himself. And of course, Paul then testifies here that in verse 9, of Colossians 2 that for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in him if you are in Christ you have everything you need to rule and reign you might ask well Pastor Dallas why am I not ruling and reigning why am I struggling so much Jesus could have asked why he was struggling so much he could have asked why do I have to die on a cross he could have asked, why is the leaders of my kinsmen rejecting me? Why, why are my fellow Jews going to be the last ones on earth to embrace me? But he didn't. He accepted the Father's will. He was willing to be humbled to the point of death. Death on a cross. And in Philippians, we, we see this here in Philippians 2. Uh, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found that way, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. So Jesus humbled himself, folks. He suffered a criminal's death. He was executed as a criminal. He was charged with crimes. He was framed and murdered. And not your ordinary murder. It was a state murder where the government murders people. He was murdered by the government. Why did he do that? Had he not done that, we would all be dead men walking. We would all be doomed to the fires of hell and damnation. Had he not done that. And he knew, he had faith to believe that his death was not going to be the end of the story. Going on in, in Philippians 2, verse 9, Therefore God has also highly exalted him, given him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you know what that means, folks? That means the day is going to come when Satan will be forced on his knees. He will bow and he will confess and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Can I get an amen? Amen. So he, he's going to get absolute power. He has absolute power. He's already highly exalted. It's an act of humility that he doesn't immediately seize power. But that humility that took him to the cross also allows him to follow the plan of the Father. There is a plan, and that plan involves our lives. It involves us having to take that humble road to power. We don't take the humble road because we're low and we're nothing. True humility is taking a lower road than what you need to. Jesus could have came onto the earth, walked in, and displayed kingly power right then. His followers were expecting him to do just that, but that's not what he did. He took the humble road. 
Now let's go back here to we was talking about where Jesus told John to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus did not get baptized because he needed to repent. He had no sin. He did not need baptism. But he asserted that it will fulfill all righteousness. Meaning it's going to fulfill your righteousness. It's going to fulfill my righteousness. Jesus did this to present himself to the one new man in which the church of Israel would inhabit. And I won't read that reference here, but you can find it in Ephesians 2, 12 to 20, where it talks about how he was to take the, these two entities, they were going to be converged into one new man. Jesus' death on the cross, Jesus' baptism, all his humble route during his earthly ministry was presenting a one new man, a body of Christ, a body of believers of both Jews and Gentiles that would inhabit. So it was for us that he was baptized. It was for us that he ended up receiving the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to just take a little bit of time here in John 16, 13 to 14. And this is part of a dissertation Jesus was giving to the disciples about what the Holy Spirit would do. And earlier, he tells them that when the Holy Spirit comes, he would convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. It's the same convicting ministry that draw, drew us who are saved to him. Everyone who's saved is saved because the Holy Spirit convicted them of their sin, that they were a sinner, convicted them of righteousness, that God is righteous, convicted them of judgment, and they knew that there was a judgment coming. In my life, it was one summer afternoon in 1981 when James Robinson said, asked, if you were to die tonight, do you know you would make heaven? The Holy Spirit came to me, talked to me, and told me I was headed to hell. I knew I was a sinner. I knew he was righteous. And I knew there was a coming judgment. And I came to him. So... That first part of that dissertation was what he's going to do in the world. But in verses 13 and 14, then uh, Jesus starts instructing them what he's going to do with, with those of us who are saved. However, in verse 13, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. This covers a wide gamut from uh, inspiring the apostles to write the scripture, to write the New Testament, to complete the canon of scripture. This is operating when the Holy Spirit gives you revelation about circumstances that are going on or, you know, sometimes God warns you. I know I was driving one day and Sister Ann can confirm this. But the Lord told me that when I was going to get in front of Taco Bell, that I was going to be in danger of an accident. And to be watching when I got right up to Taco Bell, that there was going to be a big accident. So I get up to that Taco Bell, and this, uh, uh, this car did this far pass on the right and suddenly swooped in to make a left turn. And I had to slam on my brakes. Now, had I not been warned... There probably would have been an accident. But I knew going into that, and I started slowing down, I knew something was because God told me. The Holy Spirit can do that for you. Verse 14, we see a, a doctrinal point that gives us some insight as to the nature of the anointing. It says, He will glorify me, for He will take what is mine and declare it to you. What does that mean? That means the Holy Spirit is ministering and anointing. The anointing might be revelation. The anointing might be power to lay on hands and work miracles. The anointing might be uh, just supernatural strength to do a task, supernatural endurance. It can take any of a number of forms. But the Holy Spirit is ministry. 
but not of himself. He, 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 is, he has his ear figuratively speaking to what, to what the Lord Jesus wants to do. And he's ministering from Jesus according to the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus Christ is saying here that he has executive control over the anointing. <clears throat> this leads to some interesting things when we, we think about the anointing. And, of course, the interesting thing here is that Jesus' human nature, while he was on this earth, was that of an anointed man. Luke 4, 18, he's uh, quoting from the Old Testament here, from, from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. And he goes through that whole passage in Isaiah 61. And then he closes the book after doing that reading in the synagogue and says, this day is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, Jesus was saying, I am that anointed person that the prophet was talking about. And in Acts 10, 38, we, we see this again, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So you see, Jesus' human nature on the earth was that of an anointed man. Now, you might ask, if Jesus is God, why did he need the anointing? It was for our sakes. It was for our sakes that he was anointed. Now, I created a little graphic here to show the flow of the anointing. Jesus Christ, it begins with Jesus Christ has executive control. He has command of the anointing. And that's important to know. Because if he has command and you want the anointing, how do you get it? You, you ask the Lord Jesus, say, Lord Jesus, give me this. He gives instructions to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit pours out the anointing on the anointed human. So far, so good. Not really a twist. Though. That's pretty straightforward. Straightforward, John 16. Now here's where it gets interesting. And then here, this graphic, I'm showing the biblical flow of Jesus' anointing as it is presented in Scripture. And in the next one, I'm going to show how the new apostolic reformation has distorted that with, with a warning. The flow of Jesus' anointing is Jesus Christ as the Son of God speaks to the Holy Spirit who then anointed the human nature of Jesus. Jesus Christ as the man was anointed with the Holy Spirit with God. As God, he had executive control. Now this might seem weird. This might seem bizarre. Did Jesus really need to go through all that for himself? No. No. He did it for us because he was the template for the one new man. We don't have exactly the control over the anointing as created humans. We, we are creatures. If you want the anointing of God, you have to ask God for it. You can't simply command the anointing to come and it comes. Jesus could have simply commanded the anointing. So you, ha you have this flowing of the anointing for the, the Lord Jesus here. In the NAR, however, and especially among those who deny the hypostatic union, among those who would say that when Jesus was on the earth that he, he was emptied of his deity, he was just a man. Or for those who might say, yes, we'll agree, he, he is 100% God and 100% man, but the divine nature was just put on a shelf like I might put this water underneath the pulpit here. They can't appeal to the divine nature of Jesus as a starting point. They're forced into a Gnostic or quasi-Gnostic interpretation of the Holy Spirit, which then anointed Jesus the Son of Man. And the reason that I'm saying that it's Gnostic is without understanding that Jesus is in charge of the anointing, 
You're left with this space. And I, I've seen this in the NAR. I've been to NAR churches where the mindset was that the anointing is for certain people. Certain people have the divine spark. They have the anointing of God. And the rest of us have to go to this anointed person. We have to somehow align ourselves with the anointed person, follow them, and God forbid, never, never say anything critical of anything they do. Even if they're out boring around, even if they're out committing murder, even if they're out cooking the books, never say a word because that's the anointed man of God. And if you want the anointing and blessings of God, then you have to bow before them. That NAR distortion is a lie straight from the pit of hell. Yeah. And this is part of why we at New Covenant Church of the Apostles view the new apostolic reformation as damnable heresy. And that's not really how the anointing flows. Back to our flow here. Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the anointing, has executive control of the anointing. The Holy Spirit then administers it to the anointed human, whether that anointed human is the God-man Jesus or whether it's you and me. So what does this mean? This means that we should practice the humble road, the road of humility. And why should we practice it? Because we trust in Jesus. And know that he's going to glorify us. This is what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 2, the first five verses. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in a demonstration of spirit and power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul could have came as an eloquent speaker. We have many eloquent speakers in the church. We have entire ministries that reach thousands, even millions elephants see a platform in dark churches where they can have control of the ambience and the lighting to a very fine degree. There's productions in the church that rival anything in Hollywood. There's people that will bring their wealth to the table. And they would advocate that we seize the, the, the reins of wealth and power from wealth and power and strength. We conquer the world for the kingdom of God. Did Paul do that? He could have uh, at least done some of those things. He was trained uh, by the Sanhedrin. He was trained by Rabbi Gamaliel. And likely was either on the Sanhedrin or getting ready to be on it. He was being groomed to take his place on the Sanhedrin. And he gave that up for the cross. And so Paul could have came in with eloquence. He, he had the skill set to do eloquence. He was born a Roman citizen, so he was at least above average in, in wealth and means. Certainly connections, and on some occasions Paul used it when he was about to be beaten. He invoked his Roman citizenship to avoid a beating. So Paul certainly had the means to come in from strength, but he didn't come from strength but in trembling and humility and weakness. Why his trust was in the power of God. His trust was in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he practiced a humble, humble road. He endured persecutions. He fought lions. He was in the arena. But not because he boasted he was the strongest gladiator. 
In fact, he had the thorn in the flesh, and there's speculation what it might be. Some of the speculations was it was a health issue. We don't know exactly what it is, but he had an infirmity of some kind in his flesh. And while he had it, he had to fight off lions. How many of us could be a lion if we was in the arena? Unarmed, probably none of us. It would be against us even if we had any armaments other than, than guns. I'm not sure that our, uh, I'm not sure that uh, pistol would you know necessarily take down a line. Maybe a hunting pistol, the right caliber. Paul didn't have that. They didn't have pistols back then. They didn't have advanced military weaponry. At most, he might have had some kind of sword or spear. And he was in the arena, facing off with lions. Paul was beaten and left for dead. And on one of these, uh, one occasion, may, he may have actually technically died in a manner not unlike Sister Anne did for a matter of minutes when she was on the ventilator. And he came back and he suffered persecution. He has dealt with conflict in the churches, rejection of his fellow Jews. He walked a humble road when he could have had the best of wealth and power of the day. Moses walked a humble road. He could have been uh, prime minister in Egypt. He forsook that. Spent 40 years in the wilderness with a, a bunch of stiff necks. But when you look at the long game, would we know about Moses had he been prime minister of Egypt? If Paul had taken his seat on the Sanhedrin, would he have had the impact on history that he does today? I would say not. The path of suffering resulted in them having more impact in the world today than when he was alive. It's often so hard for us to be humble because we look at our present circumstances and we look around and we think there's no way that's not possible and we don't see things from God's eyes we think the giants are too big we're just grasshoppers and we forget that Jesus Christ has executive control of the anointing. We forget that a 17-year-old boy with a sling just slung it back and forth, faced off a nine-foot giant who was dead before he hit the ground. <clears throat> God used a 17-year-old boy. Probably... I, I'm going to go a little extreme here. I don't think King David was even Robbie's size. He was probably shorter than that. He was probably in the low five foot, maybe even sub five foot. People typically weren't that, that tall back then. And we read nothing in the scripture of David having uh, excessive height. So imagine someone who's five foot six. Taking on a giant, prevailing against the giant. It's time for us to humbly seek the Lord. The beginning point is repentance. Repent of our worldly ways. Repent of having loved the world more than loving the cross. Repent of having trusted in our means rather than in God's means. And repent of not asking Christ to show up to do something. We're living in an hour that's desperate for the church. The church in America seems to be in decline. The call goes out for people to seek God. And if you call them to a big eat, we would have put out there, we're having a big eat here. We would fill this building to overflowing. Not so much with a worship service or preaching. And if you call the prayer meeting, that's the quickest way to enter the room, almost as fast as if I shouted fire. 
But just because we see no way doesn't mean that there is no way. It doesn't mean God doesn't have a way. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. So I want to close out by saying, let us humbly seek the Lord. Humbly seek the Lord Jesus. Because the Lord Jesus has exactly the control of the anointing. Ask for him to anoint us to do what we have been called to do. Ask for him to anoint us as we outreach to the community. Ask for his anointing on the revival coming up this weekend. We need the anointing. Charlestown needs the anointing. Clark County needs the anointing. Yeah. Our area is spiritually comatose. And it desperately needs the Lord. We have no chance to turn it around through simply my superior wit or our good preaching. I'm not that good of a preacher. Pastor Chris isn't that good of a preacher to do it. And I'm not saying we're not good preachers. Some of the best sermons you'll hear come from this pulpit from one of us. But that by itself is not going to do it. It needs the anointing and the power of God. We need a fresh power of God to fall. Like Pastor Chris likes to say, we are the most disposable part of the entire thing. We need God's power. And I want us to all pray this week desperately for the anointing to be on this building, to be in the town, to just move on people, to come here for their lives to be changed. Let this be a great revival, but it will only happen if the Lord shows up. Heavenly Father, we come right now, and Father, we just ask for you to move on us to humbly seek your anointing. The time of talking about revival is done. The time to attend meetings and convocations where we talk about prayer is done. Now is the time for us to pray and to seek your face. We are in the do or die moment uh, in, in America. The hour is dark in America. We know, Lord, that the judge is at the door for America. The judgment has, in fact, already begun. And, Lord, we know if revival doesn't come soon, that it will come later when we are in dire straits, when we are being thrown to the lions spiritually speaking, maybe literally speaking. So, Lord, we ask for your intervention in this community. We ask for your intervention in southern Indiana, in the Ohio Valley. Intervene and do what you will do. We pray all this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.